Good evening. I'm Guillermo de Cervantes of the Kingdom of Trimeras in the Shire of South Keep. Uh, this evening, we're doing a leadership and command class. Uh, and one of our mentors who is here with us now is Sir Yorick. Uh, again, Sir Yorick, I'm sorry, uh, please give another introduction of yourself. <laughs> sure. My name is uh, Sir Yorick Halkinerson. I've been in the SCA for uh, about 40 years um, and actively fighting since around 1989. Um, I've fought in, uh, probably over 50 inter-kingdom wars. I've, uh, bounced around a lot when I was in the service as I, uh, I'm originally from Florida. Uh, so I'm, uh, you know, a Tremerian at heart, but, uh, as I tell people that I've been a Tremerian three times, a Caidan twice, an Atlantean twice, and a Meridian once over the, over that course of time. And, uh, I've had the opportunity to fight under some of the finest field commanders, uh, in the uh, in the SCA during that time, mundanely uh, from 1997 until uh, about 2006, I actually taught operational warfare planning uh, from the battalion to the uh, to the brigade, um, sometimes even the division level for the Marine Corps and for Joint Forces. Excellent. Uh, well, last week our, our focus was on unit uh, training and command, uh, which is uh, very micro level look at the battlefield. Uh, this week, our focus is a bit more broad and, and macro. Um, you, you defined to me uh, the three stages of a battle. Could you, could you please do that? So we're uh, on the okay. same page. Oh, you mean, the, well, so there's, there's three levels of, of warfare that we talked a little bit about, the strategic, the operational, and the tactical. Um, and uh, we also talked about the, um, uh, the three time periods in which a battle has. So a battle has a beginning, it has a middle and an end. Um, <clears throat> as far as strategy operations and tactical, uh, strategy comes from uh, the Greek word uh, uh, meaning arrangement. Um, like the strat and strategy is kind of the same as the as stratified or, or levels. And um, the thing about strategic principles is that they're reasonably um, universal and eternal. They don't really change. And the strategic principles that we talk about in, in modern warfare are basically the same ones that Alexander the Great would have talked about. Uh, we might have slightly different words for talking about it, but they're basically the same thing. Um, tactical level uh, comes from the Greek word tekib, which means movement. And it is associated with the specific application of combat power against the enemy to destroy them. And it is entirely driven by the technology of the weapons, or in the case of the SCA, the rules um, of a particular battle um, will drive the quote unquote right way to do things. And operations, uh, which is really the last thing that your commander on the field at, uh, at, at, a, at a war is going to be concerned with, is how you bridge the two. And it's really about um, arranging your pieces, uh, which is what you do in the beginning of the battle, um, and giving them very basic, uh, very basic instructions on what they're supposed to accomplish. Um, you know, what's their goal in that battle? How are they contributing to the whole? And that's that's the uh, that's the beginning of the battle is laying that out, uh, where you sort of arranged all your your pieces on the board. Um, so that when you get to the middle of the battle, which is what happens after the very first sw uh, swing of a stick at the very first enemy, that it goes your way. Because your ability to kind of micromanage or direct things at a low level falls apart pretty quickly as soon as people start hitting each other. Um, no one's going to uh, no one's going to remember the things that you told them. They're only really going to remember their training. Um, so you had to have set it up so that it ends up being the way that you wanted it to be. And that goes on until most of the troops on one side or the other have uh, um, have been attrited or that the other criteria that your battle uh, was, uh, was defined against for victory, that's really starting to sort of fall in place. And then you get to the end of the battle, which is sort of the mop up and the cleanup. And that's really about uh, reforming your forces, reestablishing the command and control, getting the last bit done. And the, the secret to that the end of the battle really is, honestly, it's just paying attention faster than the other person. 
It sounds attention. like a lot of a lot of battles that I've seen in Gulf War. That's that's an area that a lot of people just it doesn't like on a field on the field battle. Usually at the end of a field battle, I don't see a lot of of tactical leadership of reforming. It's more. It just seems a bit more of a melee kind of feel. Right, and that's because most of the commanders are dead. Um, and so you have to have people who know how to step up and everybody has to have that, um, uh, that culture of just knowing, uh, alone, I'm dead. I need to go find friends and we need to go find something useful to do. And we need to find somebody who's got a keen enough melee eye to go, oh, okay, that will be the thing that will be useful, useful to do. So when, when you're bridging the gap between strategy and tactics, Sorry, I had to let out the coworker. Yes, uh, and uh, and you your 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 field commander has a strategy he wants to do. How does he communicate that to the army? How does he communicate that to? So, to so key point is the strategy is basically over when everybody shows up or starts traveling to war. Um, strategy is about what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses. We want to line our strengths up against the, the, the enemy's weaknesses, and we want to protect our weaknesses from the enemy's strengths. And we do that through the training, the motivating troops to get to war, the equipment we make sure they bring to war, the right mix of weapons, the right kind of shields, um, helping them make arrows, making sure that our, our fighting friends show up, um, have a ride, have a place to camp, you know, get fed, all that kind of things. Um, that's strategy. Uh, what does the treaty say? What battles happen on what day? That's strategy. Which ones allow archery? That's strategy. Once you get to war, operations is about, you, th you can think of it as like a big game of rock, scissors, paper. You know, nothing is, nothing is a magic bullet. Everything has something that can beat and everything that something can beat it. So you want to arrange the pieces on the field, you know, so the rocks are against the scissors, the scissors are against the paper and that the paper is against the rocks. Um, and that after the action starts, that it's going to end up with people are just naturally going to fall into the places that you want them to go. Um, and what you're, trying, you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to ensure that at the point of contact, at the point of impact, that you outnumber the other guy. Now, obviously having sheared more numbers than them do, uh, they do, it goes a long way towards that, but it's not necessarily essential. And being outnumbered does not necessarily mean you're going to lose. Uh, I was in co uh, command of the army, uh, section of the army of Kaid, uh, I think it was 2006 for Estrella, and we were outnumbered 183 to 600. And uh, we actually won quite a few of those battles because we were able to string out the other side um, or, or bunch up the other side, the way the terrain uh, was laid out so that they weren't really in the fight where all of our folks were in the fight. Um, we were able to cut off sections of their unit. So rather than be in one big general fight where we're outnumbered three to, three, uh, three to one, we made it into a series of fights where we outnumbered them three to two. And eventually they just ran out of extra people and we won. Mm -hmm. um, a little harder to do on the field, but it's possible, but it's definitely, something that you can do in city battles, ravine battles, broken field battles, and things like that, where you can use the terrain to your advantage to cut off sections of the enemy so that they're just not in the fight. Mm -hmm. But you always wanna make sure your folks are, 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 uh, are, are able to uh, utilize what's called the interior lines of communication, that they can move more quickly um, towards different parts of the battlefield that they can get where they need to go. Uh, a lot of it is kind of like playing chess, which is why we use ch chess in period as a way of, of training people to think um, for combat. You know, if you think about having the knights in the center of the board, you command a large section of the board. Nobody can go in there without you being able to attack them. Um, and you have the interior lines of communication because you can now put your pieces to it to threaten their pieces much more effectively than they can. They have to go all the way around the outside which means it takes longer and it requires more people. Um, so those are the kind of things that you wanna do by, by, by setting up your, um, uh, uh, setting up your, um, uh, your, your folks. 
Um, and you can do that by looking at who are you faced against? What are the terrain features? How are they likely to fight? And who are your units? And how are they likely to fight? You know that if you are against Kalantir, they're going to be relatively slow moving, but they're going to be reasonably immobile. So you don't want to A, depend on them to be a fast moving unit. And B, you don't want to end up having to hit them at the end of the fight in piecemeal. You know, so isolating them, um, dragging them into a fight so that uh, they're, uh, they're not reinforcing other troops, but making sure that you have the opportunity to get all your folks together to hit them when you actually really hit them in earnest, that's a way to deal with Kalantir. If you have a smaller, fast-moving unit, well, you need to make sure you know where they are. You don't want to let them get into your backfield. But if they, if they hit uh, determined resistance and, and, and if you shoot well, oh, they're going to get blown apart. So make sure that when, you know, when that contact happens, that's who they're hitting. Um, archery is great for picking off uh, uh, units that are heavy in spears, and especially for picking off commanders and other archery units, but they don't necessarily deal so well against a, a slow moving shield wall um, because they don't have any targets available to them. So don't just stand there and let them pepper you with arrows, make sure that you have the ability to just kind of walk them down you know, with, with, while protecting your own folks. Those are the kind of things that you want to think about as you're dispersing your troops and, um, and, and setting up for the battle. So you talked about the different kinds of commanders. What, what is a staff commander? So you basically have um, three levels that matter, you know, for our kind of combat. The first is your general and their staff. Uh, so there's actually several types of generals. And you need somebody who can fill all the different types of roles. So the top level general, I usually think of them in terms of three roles. You have a garrison commander, a staff officer, and a field commander. The garrison commander and the best ones in Tamaris are probably Baldar and Spider. Those are the guys who are going to motivate people to go to practice, make sure they have the right kind of uh, the right kind of sword, the right kind of axe, the right kind of shield, that they're going to get a ride, that they're going to show up. Um, when they're when they're uh, they're they're trained, they know the commands, uh, they know the things they need to do. That's all the stuff that happens before we ever leave, um, and that and that that's a full full year's job is is the is the garrison commander. The staff officer is the person who makes sure that we have allies, and that everybody knows who's on our side, that they're motivated to show up, that they're having fun with us, so they're gonna fight hard. Um, that nobody's getting uh, bent or butt hurt because they feel like they got slighted. Um, all those kind of things about keeping the allies and, 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 and getting the, the core of the army together. And then the field commander, as, as the name implies, they're just sort of, uh, they're, they're um, uh, uh, oh yeah, fi finer staff officers in Tremaris, probably Martin and, and back in the day, Thorsten. Um, always did a very good job with, with getting our allies. Um, and then um, uh, your field commanders um, are the guys who are actually setting up those operations. Um, and I'm gonna go into this in a second. I usually think in terms of these of uh, what we call stat modern staff codes or battlefield operating systems for those of you guys who are army guys. Um, those were more or less invented by Napoleon, although they've been around in one form or another forever, because again, it's operational and strategic level of war hasn't changed much. He just sort of codified it. Um, and that's how we still do it. So you have uh, what we call movement maneuver, and that's about getting people where they need to go and giving them the, the major unit orders, what we call gross muscle movements. You go left, you go center, you go right. Um, you go fast, you go medium, you go slow. You don't generally want to, at that level of the generalship level, tell people, you want to turn left and then go down that tree and then down the field, because as soon as it starts, everyone's going to forget what you told them. The bad guys are going to do something you didn't expect them to, and then they're not going to know what to do. So again, a lot of a lot of being that general is telling people what you want to have accomplished, as opposed to telling them how to go do it. Um, and then you let the individual commanders, the unit commanders, which is that second level, you let them on their own initiative, skills, and experience go. Oh, okay. Well, you want me to make sure that none of the bad guys get through the middle of the field. Well, because of what they're doing, I need to go here. And that'll be the best the best way to have, have that happen. So they're the they're the ones who do actually have to remember what's the plan, and figure out how to execute the plan by doing something 
that's intelligent based on what their people are capable of, how many of them they have left, what the mix of weapons is, and what the bad guys are doing. Mm -hmm. And then the lowest level is your is your sergeants, and the sergeants are the ones who are about the the nitty gritty of making sure the tactics are done correctly, um, making sure the line stays dressed, making sure that the stragglers uh, meet up with somebody, making sure that people get water when they need to for resurrection fights, making sure that the commands are echoed so people know if 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 we're supposed to wheel left that everybody knows we wheel left. And if there's any stragglers, hit them in the back with your, you know, with your your weapon half. So hey, wheel left, um, all those kind of things. And then they know how to step up and to take command of the unit in that end game if the commander has already been killed. So would that be a, a sergeant? Would be like a line commander? Well, so I think the sergeant would be they're they're the deputy line commanders, but they're mostly the what we used to call file closers. Um, and uh, it's kind of what the adjutant is actually supposed to be in a, in a, in a marching unit. Um, that's the person who makes sure the unit stays formed, that they're all doing the thing in the direction they're supposed to. So if they said wheel left, everybody's wheeling left. If, if we're now engaged in a line and some guys are, 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 are pulling back because they're a little scared of the guy that's in front of them, that they don't pull back so much that they gap the line and make a big hole that they move, excuse me, that they move forward making sure that people press the contact. There are some exceptions, but in general, it's a terrible idea to stand five feet away at spear range from the bad guys. You're just gonna get peppered in the face and your shieldman can't fight. So you want to hit people to contact. Um, you generally wanna keep, keep on them, press on them, get close to them and just move forward with deliberate intent. Have the shieldman stay alive. They should really only be killing people who do something stupid. Their job is to stay alive and to keep the, the combat power from coming through the shield wall, where it's the spears and the axes, their job is to go kill folks. Mm -hmm. And they can't do it if they're too far away. Yeah, that was something that we talked about last month is how the importance of the shield wall is to not die and protect- Not die, them. exactly. And, uh, and by doing that, it allows those, the, the killers to do their job. Right. So we talked about uh, the training of the units. We talked about recruitment. Um, you mentioned the treaty. Um, I mean, normally when we think of a treaty, it's the end of the battle or after a war, but it sounds like you're, a treaty is an agreement before the battle, before the war in the SCA. Right, so your, your respected kingdom seneschals and, and, and the um, uh, crown, they're gonna sit down some number of months beforehand um, and they're going to hammer out the treaty. And that's going to say, you know, on Thursday, we're going to do the count battle. It'll be sometime in the morning. We'll, we'll do, it'll be last man standing um, or timed, you know, redoubts. Uh, we'll allow archery. We'll do it twice. We'll allow archery in the first one. Um, you know, it's, it's all those kind of details about uh, how the, the martial activities are going to unfold and how many war points it's worth, when is the fencing, when are the tournaments. Um, so a lot of that is like, okay, we know that Glen Aubin shows up on force on Friday, you know? Um, okay, well, make sure the battles that, where, where sheer numbers are gonna have a significant impact. If we don't think we have the numbers coming, well, let's make sure that those battles are before Friday. Mm -hmm. um, in general, those things don't change very often. But I've been going now to Gulf Wars for 25 years, and they have changed a couple of times. Um, and so that's something the Crown wants to keep in mind um, is, okay, when do our people show up? What are we good at this year? Do we have any archers really left? You know, we've gone through periods where we had an enormous amount of, um, of uh, superiority in archery um, to times where we basically had nobody and they weren't very good, and then back up again. Um, we've had times where our command and control was fantastic. And then we've had times where our command and control was not so good. And, and uh, there's been times where Anstiora's command and control was enormously awesome. And then there's times where it was terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and there's times where, you know, we know that uh, uh, JC and Hogarden aren't showing up. So their spear fighting isn't going to be as good as it is. Okay. Well, how can we take advantage of that? Hmm. So and, I, could, and I, I, I could see that 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 um, intelligence, you know, and knowledge about your enemy, knowledge about your own 
your own strengths, your own weaknesses. I could see how that could be very chess-like in that treaty process. Exactly. So the way we think about it, so the, the second staff code is actually intelligence. That's your G2, S2 um, is, is intelligence. And um, in period, that was actually the role for the heralds because they would go out there and go, oh, th th that livery is so-and-so. You know, so-and-so is good at this, this, and this. Oh, but he's in the middle of a squabble with his wife's family. So his mind's not in the game, you know? And and uh, at a certain extent, that stuff actually, is, you know, applies here. Oh, that's such and such a household, but they're in the middle of a big dramatic squabble. So they may not be, you know, they may not be here in the numbers or they're not going to be fighting as hard as they, as they normally are, you know? Uh, just because they're your ally doesn't necessarily mean that they're really, really, really on your side or really, really, really uh, symmetric in terms of their, uh, in terms of their their hatreds. And this is extremely period, where where a king going to war has to try to get all their bannermen together. Um, we and, saw that uh, in Braveheart. We saw that in Braveheart. We actually, I was going to say, it's probably one of the few things that Game of Thrones did a pretty good job with. Um, it's something that we had to relearn during the Iraq and Afghanistan conflict that just because they're our allies doesn't necessarily mean they're the enemies of all the people who are our enemies allies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there are times where they're just, uh, let me think. Um, well, right now with the, with, uh, with what's going on, the, the current war with Russia. Excellent so, example. Yeah. You know, excellent they're, example. They're attacking like, their own families, basically. In, in, in a way, yes. Um, uh, the uh, you know, there's there's there are Ukrainians who are Russian speaking who think of themselves more as Russians. There are Belarusians that think of themselves as more as Russians. But there are also Russians who, well, quite frankly, hated the Soviet era, so they may find a higher affinity with the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so. Uh, the motivation of the allies matter. The, the motivation of the allies matters. Yeah, you know, like you don't want to put an ally against somebody else that they, they, they're not going to want to fight. Mm -hmm. You know, the east and the middle will love fighting each other. So, putting them right next to each other and telling them to work together, that might not work out. Um, but um, uh, well, I'm trying to think of an example here. It's kind because of like it's it's kind of like a. But but say there there are times where like. Atlantia may be our ally, but they really don't want to fight hard against Anciora. So you need to set them up against somebody else on Anciora's side <laughs> that they are going to be wanting to fight. It's like seating at a wedding. Exactly. It's exactly what it is. Seating at a wedding. <laughs> and it's something that you have to think about in the disposition of your troops. That's amazing. And, and, and probably even in your own kingdom because you have households. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, you know, they haven't been around in a long time, but you had the, the wild cards of uh, Iron Lance at Gulf Wars or uh, the two Chucks in, uh, in Penzik, where you're not quite sure what they're going to do. Some, on some days, it's a dice roll. So depending on where they are, you, you, have, to, you have to account for that. Mm -hmm. So logistics, um, that, that's so, a big part of logistics for sure. Yeah, so logistics is code four. We didn't talk about operational fires. That's code three. So that is, what are the missions I'm sending my guys after? Um, you know, so there basically you have main force, which is go get them, but but that's not a strategy for the army. That's a that's a mission for a unit at a particular time in the battlefield. Sometimes it's cordon and hold, make sure that nobody passes this point. Sometimes it's air control. Uh, you know, if anybody decides to be dumb enough to drop their shield, make sure they get an arrow in the face. Um, sometimes it's it's holding land. Sometimes it's IS, uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. You guys go over there. Let me know what the other guys are doing. If they go to left on the tree, you know, raise your left hand. If they go right around the tree, raise your right hand, because that's going to tell me something that I need to do to, to, to tell another unit to go do something a particular way. Um, what we call there is uh, uh, named and target areas of interest where there are important parts of the battlefield that you want them to pay attention to because they are tied to decision-making criteria that you have for the rest of the army and what it's doing. You wanna keep it simple, you wanna keep it obvious, and you wanna make sure there's somebody who knows that's, that's their job because it won't just happen on its own. Um, but it's a good way to, to think about how to pace the battle as it goes through those phases by saying, okay, once they get past that tree, 
we're in this phase. So you guys go forward. And as soon as you get them, as soon as they get past that line, you know, run that way so that we know that this, this is, this is where we are now. Um, logistics is code four. Code four is about uh, resurrections, water, and time, and shagging arrows. Those are the things that you are managing resources um, for the most part in, in, in logistics as a, as a general. Bringing up reserve forces is really code one, but, but make sure the archers are getting all their arrows inspected and they're getting them back and everybody knows where they are. And if they need help, you don't want to be leaving arrows on the field, you know, if, if you don't need to, because that's arrows that you can't shoot. Make sure everybody gets their water so they're not dropping out, you know, when you need them most. Make sure that if it's a limited resurrection fight that you're managing the resurrections. And if it's not a limited resurrection, make sure that everybody knows where the resurrection points are and that they're going to the resurrection points. And if they're resting, they're not doing it so that everybody else has to trip over them. And then time. And time is an important one in the way that we have our battles organized for, uh, um, for uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised. Water is always a tough one. Um, uh, time is an important one because a lot of the battles have time components. Either you hold a thing at a given time or you hold the thing for the most amount of time or if it's a resurrection fight, how much time is left. And you want to make sure that every when it's five minutes left in the reservation, right, you want to make sure everybody knows that so that the guys who've been resting and saving it up can get back out there. There are times, depending on where the resurrection points are, that you can kind of go spike the football by driving them back to the resurrection point if they don't have enough time to resurrect and get their people out. But you don't want to be doing that 10 minutes before the end of the fight because then they're just going to all resurrect and kill you. Um, so, uh, and then of course, just knowing whether or not you've, you've taken the territory for the lengths of time that you need or the banner or whatever that you need to for the amount of time that you need it. So making sure that you know what the official time is, that you've correlated the official time and then that you have a way of communicating to the commanders what the official times are is very important. I remember this year at Go Forward during the uh, commanders, the war council, uh, once we were talking about the time battles uh, uh, Duke Martin made a point of saying, I will go to CVS and get us some stopwatches so we can monitor our time. Uh, and, and I think that played a big part. Uh, Har Haramatsu makes a comment about water. This last Gulf War, water was rough. My wife was running around like a chicken with her head cut off to get to everybody. <laughs> so was it, it sounds like but that level of those things that you're talking about with logistics, it sounds like those are things that are covered by the, not, not the generals or by the marshals, but the people who are organizing the event. You know? Well, yes and no. I mean, getting it there is part of that, but it's actually the general's responsibility to make sure he, they know where they are and that the people know how to get to them. Mm -hmm. And if they're not covered, making sure that you have a plan B. Okay. Because uh, it, it is, the general is accountable. The, the, the um, event stewards are usually responsible, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll actually get it done. The general is always ultimately accountable. Okay. So if it's not planned, if it's not organized, the general is gonna make sure somebody gets it, gets it done. Right. And that again, would be something that should be planned for before the battle. Yes. Well, well ahead of time. So, uh, so a lot of this stuff we're talking about are the things, you know, that are before the battle is taking place, the training of the units, preparing the equipment, recruiting allies, the, uh, the treaty, for, uh, logistics, uh, the war council. All this is before. All this is happening before anybody's gone onto the battlefield. Right. Hmm. What about uh, what about the uh, breaking down the, the the battle? The you said the time the, the time frame. What's the focus at the beginning of the battle? So again, the focus at the beginning of the battle. This is good because this code five is your command and control. So. Uh, um, 
the, the focus at the beginning of the battle is, is setting up your units, movement, maneuver, making sure you know who the bad guys are, no, making sure you know what the enemy centers of gravity are. You know, what's, what's the thing they're most proud of? What are they hinging the success of their army on? Because that's exactly the thing you want to go hit. What does that mean, center of gravity? So centers of gravity, is, this comes from Carl von Clausewitz. Um, and he was talking about how, you know, in his case, writing about uh, 18th century warfare, it was cities, cities and manufacturing capability. That was the, se the center of gravity for fighting another country. Um, the way I like to point it out is that militaries don't go to war, countries do. So for every person in the field, there are 20 people somewhere else that is supporting that person in the field. They're making them bullets, they're making them bedrolls, they're making them food. Um, they're, they're providing the, the, um, they're providing fresh recruits. They're supporting the war effort. They're, they're voting for the, for the guy who's going to prosecute the war effort, you know, in a democracy, um, all that stuff matters. Um, and if you don't have it, you're not going to win. Um, you have to, you know, in democracy, you have to make the case to people for why you're in the, in the, in the fight in the first place. Um, and, uh, so in the SCA, you still have centers of gravity. They're just a little different. You know, is it that a, there's a particular unit that's sort of the pride of the kingdom? You know, okay, let, we're going to go crush them on, you know, first. And then everyone's going to get more demoralized because they're bad. You know, it's like the, the, uh, the immortals and the Persian, you know, all right, well, they're not living up to their name today, you know, so that's demoralizing. Um, is it their spear combat? Okay, well, how do you negate their spear combat? Well, you go, you you basically give them a screen wall and you shoot arrows at them until they're all dead. Um, is it their, is it their command and control? Well, make sure that the archers know to kill all their commanders, um, or keep them from being able to communicate. Get them in the middle of a fight where they don't have enough time to think about fight, uh, communicating or, or signaling. Um, is it um, uh, uh, is it uh, is it their shield wall? Okay, well, don't. Don't 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 break like uh, waves on their shield wall. Make sure this is a fast moving fight, so they never get a chance to plant. Make sure they get, get them so that they get strung out, so that you don't have to hit the whole unit all at once. That you hit them piecemeal. You know, so it's that's and that'll change every every fight, every kingdom, every every war is going to be different. Um, so you determine what the center of gravity is, and you make sure the plan is okay. That's the thing that we want to attack because that's the thing that's going to give us the most value. So um, when I think about Trimeris and our, my observations of our centers of gravity, uh, one, of, one thing I think about is our constitution. Um, we're, we, we're blessed to be in a state where we can fight almost year round. And in uh, battles like the ravine battle, we tend to do much better than I think other, other, other um, kingdoms because we have a, a, a very good constitution because we're, we're used to. Used to the heat. Used to the heat, we're used to the grind. You know, yeah, and our archers, good. and our archers have, have always been a strength for us. And th those are both good points. So we wanna make sure A, that there's as much archery as possible, especially if we're coming in force. And if we have the opportunity to have the, um, uh, the fights where we need the, uh, the, the resilience um, and constitution, let make sure they, they're under the days where we have all our folks there. All righty. Um, so what about the second second phase of the second stage of battle? So, so again, that's, you know, so you, you, you have, uh, you design it in time as you have the beginning, the middle, and the end. You also have to think about the battlefield in space. And this is an important thing for the commander to walk the battlefield with, preferably with the unit commanders beforehand and kind of figure out. So you have your, your left and right uh, limit lines. So we don't want the battle to get out past that and that. You know, obviously if, if it's the wear edge, then you know, have an official boundary. But you may want to actually set a different boundary. Don't let the action get past this point because it's too hard to get people over there to help you. Or if, if they win, then they're going to be in our backfield. So we don't want to let it get past that. So you want to focus the action. And then you have your phase line A and your phase line B. And phase line A is where physically on the battlefield are you expecting to have your first troops in contact? You want to have it in a place where they can defend, where they're, they're not having to worry about being exposed on a flank, where they have the high ground if possible. Um, you know, again, 
controlling those interior lines of communication. And then phase line B is where do you expect everybody when we go into the end game? So the end game again is all about reforming. Uh, reform is probably the, the second most important thing that people be know, know how to be able to do um, in, uh, in, in, in SCA fighting. The first thing is knowing how to engage the enemy and not stand at spear range. The second thing is knowing how to reform in the end game. So how would Blitzkrieg fit into all of this? So Blitzkrieg, uh, uh, even though the, it was popularized by the Nazis, was actually invented by the Prussian uh, high command in the 1870s in the Franco-Prussian War. Um, Helmut von Goethe wrote uh, uh, his, his treat treatise on war. And what Blitzkrieg is translates as lightning war, and it's not really necessarily about physical speed, it's about speed of action. And what it does is it sets forward uh, uh, four principles that you use to organize your army as it fights so that you can efficiently achieve your goals where the units don't necessarily have to be in constant communication with each other. So at, at the end of the day, there's two ways to, to, to run an army, bottom up and top down. Um, the top down is sort of the, the, the ancient Greek model. You have a lot of officers. Um, you know, you have generals, you have under generals, you have regimental commanders. It's very hierarchical. Um, and if you look at like uh, Napoleonic or, or um, uh, so American Civil War, those are very top down hierarchical command and control structures. You know, orders come from the top down. Uh, bottom up is more like World War II, Vietnam, modern warfare. And that is where uh, Blitzkrieg comes in. So there's four components of Blitzkrieg. The first is Friedrich Spitzengefühl, which means uh, intuitive competence. You want to make sure that your people are trained to a high degree to know what to do. Um, I, I have like a, a three to five bullets that I, that I tell everybody. It's like, look, you know, this is testable. At the end of the day, you're only going to remember what you're trained. You're not going to remember what somebody told you five minutes ago. You got to remember these things. You know, you got to get in the enemy's face. Speed is life. Um, it's not the bullet with your name on it you got to worry about. It's the one labeled to whom it may concern. You know, make sure that you're paying attention because it's the stuff you're not paying attention to that's going to kill you. Any three of us can kill any one of them. Um, regroup. You know, those are the those are the those are the kind of things that you want to have beaten into people's heads. Um, the um, uh, Let's see, what was I, uh, uh, where was I going with this now? Um, oh yeah, okay, so intuitive competence, making sure that people know how to lock shields, how they know to move as a unit, all those kind of things. The second thing is, is uh, SharePunked, uh, which is um, commander's intent. Everybody needs to know what are the victory conditions and what do you expect me to, um, yeah, our portion of that. What is our 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 unit or our local area on the battlefield? What is our contribution to that uh, to that commander's intent? The next thing is Einheit, which is um, unity of command. That is who's in charge, who's in charge when he gets killed, and what are they responsible for? And and how how does that fit in with the other people who are, are responsible for different things? How do, how do we work? Chain of command, right? And the last thing is off talks tactic, or what uh, the modern army calls mission command. And mission command is how you think about the th synchronization, like the thing that you're doing, how is that contributing towards the next step in the battle unfolding in our side's victory? You know, if my job is to own the middle of the battlefield, how does that contribute? Well, it keeps the enemy from being able to move through it so that as the other units are trying to outflank them that they can't reinforce. I don't need to, I don't need to kill everybody. I just need to own it. They can't pass through it without being threatened by me as an right. example. So would, would heralds be helpful in passing on the, the commands of the general to the army? They are, and you wanna keep those commands very unambiguous and very simple. Um, you know, I've seen colored flags used and really, you know, you get four colors that are unambiguous, right? Red, yellow, green, and blue maybe. Um, and um, if you have more possible selections than four, it's too complicated. 
generally you want to keep generally you want to keep with a rule of threes. Don't how make you anybody use, have how would you use the flags? How would that work? I'm sorry. How would you use the flags? Uh, you could say, um, uh, you guys don't move forward until you see the red flag. You know, the red flag indicates that the conditions that I want in the battlefield for you guys to be moving forward are true. I, that's, that's, that is that's that is really a level of complexity that you can't do unless you've trained it. And even, like I said, even if you try to do something like that, you have to have trained it all year round and literally maybe four possibilities. Generally, you don't want to give it anybody more than three things to remember or think about and that's the commanders the troops are going to forget them the second leon happens mm -hmm. you want the commanders to not have to think about more than three things generally you want each commander to think about one thing okay so that's blitzkrieg um can you talk or give us an example of uh, uh, a few uh battlefield uh strategies that might be applied um, just so that we can take away uh, some idea of how, how we might work on a battlefield, what kind of strategies are effective uh, from history uh, in the SCA? Sure. So the thing that most people want to try to accomplish is either a single or a double envelopment. Um, and what that does is it maximizes your troops at the point of contact while taking a lot of the enemy troops out of the fight until you've basically killed your way to them. Um, the single envelopment was popularized by Alexander the Great, uh, particularly the Battle of Gargamela. Um, you can look that one up online. He had what, we, the, what they called the, the hammer and the anvil. So the anvil was the left of, of the Macedonian army and it was um, heavily, relatively heavily armored, uh, phalanx, um, the, they move, they move intractably in a straight line. They don't maneuver very well. They're not very fast. But if you push people onto them, they're going to get annihilated. The, 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 um, the hammer uh, was the cavalry and the peltas, the lighter troops that were off to the right. And what they did was they, they drew out the, uh, the, the, the Persian lines and basically folded them back over onto the, onto the, you know, onto the anvil, hence the hammer and anvil. And, and what they did was they had all this long crescent going all the way around where every one of their people were engaged. Most of the people in the backfield for the, um, uh, for the, uh, 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 for the, for the Persians were, were basically not involved in the fight until they, until they killed their way to them. So, so they had a series of fights where they were always outnumbering the enemy. Um, <clears throat> the double envelopment is exemplarized by the Battle of Cannae, which was, which was Rome. Um, and that's, you'll, you'll hear that as the horns of the bull or the double envelopment, uh, fire sack um, was how uh, General Schwarzkopf referred to it in, uh, in the first Gulf War, because that was actually our strategy in Iraq, um, was, was, that, uh, was that double envelopment. So the, the way that you do that is you put your, your heaviest, hardest fighting troops on the flanks and your relatively weaker guys in the center. And uh, we used to do at Kaid what we called the tethered goat, where we had this one light unit of mostly Florentine and two sword, two two handed sword fighters, which are not tremendously useful in a field battle in and of themselves. Um, and we would put them in the center, and the enemy would go, "Oh, look, fresh meat!" And then we go charge after them. And when they did that, you would basically form a yeah, form a kill pocket around them and it just naturally occurred that you were gonna be able to double envelop it. So if you see in this picture here, everybody that's in the circle can hit somebody in the X's, but the guys who are in the middle of the X's there can really only reach one or two of the circles. So they're effectively out of the fight, at least until you get kill your way to them. Then, uh, so for smaller groups, um, what you're trying to do is you're trying to maneuver so that you are the center of a circle where only some of the enemy units are on the edge of the circle and everybody else is behind them. You're always trying to maneuver some portion of the enemy between you and the rest of the enemy. So you're fading out to the left or right um, so that you only have to fight a small number of guys at any given time. 
and then you're working your way towards the rest of them. You don't want them to be able to gang up on you and basically envelop you. You can do that same kind of thing, um, even up to numbers maybe as large as 50, um, on, on a, uh, or, or, or maybe maybe up to 100, depending on how good your command and control is and your unit commanders are in, uh, in, in executing and seeing orders, where you're, you're basically moving fast so that most of the enemy's army is generally out of the fight most of the time. Um, uh, there was a, a, a stray, not a stray, um, Petra, where out in Kaid, uh, where we were absolutely and amazingly effective at that. Uh, I actually saw the battlefield circle around three times, but we were outnumbered by the Aiden Velters and just kept running the battlefield. Um, and, and different groups would, I think at one point I was pulling off like eight, eight or 10 guys from the other side. Ran them pretty much all the way. I mean, of course, they pummeled me like a baby seal by the time they caught me, but it took 10 guys out of the fight for a pretty long time. By the time they got back to their unit, it was all the completely other side of the battlefield. And at that point, it was all over with the crying. Um, so so that's something that you can do. I've, there was another um, West Kaid war where I was in command of, of the Iron Brigade, and we did a variation on Kursk, which was a big tank battle in Russia in World War II, where we had a very thin line in the front and then a thicker line behind them and the main force in the back and the and, and basically got down to the uh started forward where the enemy wanted to rush the front line because they thought they were going to outnumber them and they just faded back without really engaging them until they hit the second line and then and then the guys hit it but you were able to kind of cut off the front of their unit and but they kept coming in so then we faded back to the main line so that by the time they got to us they were strung out all the way along the battlefield and we were at the point of impact we outnumbered them about three to one so it was a lure basically you were lured basically down. we lured them into uh, and lured them into chasing us down there was a uh, i was watching a video um on strategy and it, it made me think that it might be effective uh, uh in our in field battle at gulf war where uh an army would start off it would start off in traditional, but at some point that the, this army would split. Uh, uh, hold on, let me turn off the eraser. <laughs> I'm learning how to do this. Draw. Okay. No, that's not. And so that so if these are the sidelines, the armies would split split. So, so you're taking advantage of the boundaries of the war. Absolutely. And it would for this for lures this the other, the northern army into having to split to engage them, and when they split, then. Uh, well, so if I were in charge, I would put all of my guys over here on your your left. Mm -hmm. And I would just roll, I would just run down that run down that battlefield line and smack into those guys. It would mm -hmm. be too far for the guys on the right. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd have to have a small unit here in the middle to keep the you know basically to screen them, so they think they don't realize what you're doing. But I would put all the weight on the one side and push them over. Right. So I would you, just, you, you would you would just mind. take on one side. I would I would not 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 exactly, but I would it would be more like. 65% of the troops would be here on the left and 35% of the troops would be here on the right. And the, and, the, and the guys on the left would be hitting them hard. The guys on the right would be screening and basically keeping them from, keeping them from, uh, no, all the way over on the left, like literally down the line. I'm learning how to do this just as we're talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're saying yeah, like, all the way over. Yeah, like 65% of the troops hitting them hard there. And then these guys would be screening them on the other side to keep them from being able to join up. One of the battles that we fought at uh, TMT was kind of like this. Uh, uh, Shosai, myself, and one or two other folks basically strung out a whole bunch of their, their folks on, the, on our left. And, and while the guys on the right basically ran down uh, their troops. Well, that was, it. That, was it. that was the second step for the, for my the Southern group. <laughs> Is that they have res have reserves, and their reserves were waiting for this split to take place. So then the reserves would move in and 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 envelop envelop 
you know, this army. And then the and then the and then the two groups would be able to come back and attack this army. Because the reserves were holding back, waiting for that split to happen. Right. Now you don't want to hold them out of the battle, you just want them lightly engaged. So what the, the reserves in this case would be doing is they would be engaging that skirmish line mm -hmm. that I brought forward um, so that we were basically at a standstill. And what that would allow you to do is shift those troops there on, on your right over to the left to hit mm -hmm. the guys, to hit, to hit my weight. Again, with those um, internal lines of communication, assuming that the terrain was favorable to that. So it would be more like uh, you, you, the skirmish group is part of this group they're, yes. just they're just ready to move when they get the when they when they get the situation is right. Right. And then they would engage. Yeah, there's no point in keeping them hanging them back because then they're not doing anything. They're not in the battle. I'm looking for a move function. I don't see it. <laughs> All right. So uh, I saw Soshai is here. Uh, what do you think of the strategy? Soshai? Any thoughts? But yeah, um, at Gulf Wars, the battle lines run from one side all the way to the other. And I've had people tell me, oh, well, you can't do any flanks here. But you can because it's going to break apart somewhere. Right. right. And your reserve unit you're talking about can be in the middle or it can be over on one side, but you wait, you let everything get it engaged. And within one minute, maybe two, something's gonna break open. There's gonna be a hole. You can go through that hole and flank in either direction. And then you're gonna to totally disrupt them. So um, if there's a break so you're here. onto something. If there's a break here, you can take advantage of it. Right, you gotta wait till it's about 20 or 30 feet wide, and then you go through it with either a small unit or two or three small units that are stacked. So you got the units forming a column. Not that everybody's not single file people, but a group of, of seven and another group of seven and another group of seven behind them. And you go through the hole and you all turn the same way and you run down the back of the line. You don't have to heavily engage them. If you come up and you start tapping glaives and spears, they're gonna turn around to face you and then no one is supporting their shield wall and the unit in front of them will kill them off. In the meantime, your unit that's flanking, your unit in the rear will be taking almost no casualties because you aren't really fighting that hard. You aren't really directly killing people. You're just causing the people in front of the people you're engaging to have no support and then they get killed. And you can yeah, roll the, all the uh, way down the line. The, the, the second battle, the second field battle at Gulf Wars this last year, um, we did something similar <laughs> to that. Basically we told, uh, uh, I, think, I think it was Meridia, as we told them like, you guys hang out over there, don't move. Yeah, you know, we're gonna move forward, stay back one unit just so that they, they don't think they can flank us on the left. But as soon as those guys get sucked away, run into their backfield and cause as much hate and discontent as you can. And it was actually a fairly resounding victory for us, which was, um, you know, that, that we didn't win that one overall. and We got beat pretty hard on the other ones, but that one, that second one was actually a pretty resounding victory. If, if you can, it, it's always amazed me in SCA combat. If you can get into the backfield of the enemy, they panic as if the weapons were real and as if you could kill them from behind. They just, they just kind of fall apart. Hermatsu wants to uh, make a comment. Feel free. Sure. Hey guys, um, with that uh, field battle we were talking about at um, this past Gulf Wars where we didn't do so hot with a couple of those fights, um, something that I wanted to mention. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Um, something I wanted to mention that um, Spider and I were talking about on the field side there. Um, one of the things that I'm glad we're doing more melee practices this year that really got us killed on, a, especially that second one that you're talking about, sir, um, was our cardio. Our guys were not moving fast to get where we needed to go. 
um as an army so like when i was looking at Guy's um strategy that he was coming up with with the split we would get murdered if we had tried that this past time with how long it took us to get where we needed to go and it wasn't any one group's fault just as an overall army we moved slower than average which okay, granted, i think that i think you know that's a universal truth because of yeah. covid this yeah, is exactly our, in our first right. war we not a lot of people haven't fought for two or three years yeah um and that that was definitely a symptom of it which is why i'm glad like this past um kingdom event we did that melee practice and we did it for most of the afternoon to really get people gassed and get practicing like that um because one thing like if you can push anything at your fighter practices is just get in your helmet get out there and get used to it again because covid did a number on everybody's i mean look at the trimarian champions list we were all wanting to die by the end of that <laughs> And if we have well, if you have four fighters, you can start training for unit. Yeah. You, you know, you can start training for melee. If you have four just four fighters, you know, you got a spearman and you got a shieldman. Yeah. That, that, that's an excellent point. And and it sort of as a corollary to that as the commander, don't be trying to expect things out of your guys that they're just not trained and you know, trained and 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 conditioned to do. Um, you know, keep it simple. Um, be 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 realistic about what your capabilities are and aren't. Um, and deploy them accordingly. You know, are we in years past, we had some really complicated plans. It looked great on paper, but it's like there's just no way anybody's going to be able to execute it. You know, they're not seals. They're not Delta Force. They're not training this. Um, you know, sixty hours a week. You know, for the three months prior to, um, which is you know, and anything again more than anything, one to three things to have to think of is too complicated. Yeah. So uh, time is set. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, um, Jerry, before you got into Black Sword, um, when we first started doing melees, we were very weak. Uh, we had a lot of new fighters, and if we heavily engaged with anybody, they were going to beat us. But if we picked a hole and we trained to stay together and trained to move. Um, as Hiramatsu said, we could run, we couldn't necessarily fight, <laughs> but we could run down the back of a line and then whoever was in front of them would kill them off. We didn't have, we didn't have to heavily engage where we took big casualties. Right. Um, we would just right. harass them and, and so forth. So as Jerry said about capabilities, if you, if you have troops that are great at straight ahead fighting, they don't move fast fine, put them in a heavy hitting unit with bridge shields, even on the field and heavily engage people and push them around. But if you've got guys who are not terribly experienced, teach them to run and teach them to go to the rear and just harass people. Uh, like Jerry said in that other battle where you get people to chase you and, and then they're out of the battle. This last, uh, this last Gulf War, we had the uh, battle to end all battles on Saturday. And that was a timed battle. And I, I had a unique perspective as an archer of that battle because I got to si fight uh, uh, the defense of the, the defense posture for both, both armies. I got to switch. And one, the, the, the tactic that really worked the best was, was as a defense to make them run, you know, make them chase you. You know, because it's a timed battle, uh, you know, you, you, you don't want to just go head to head because you're just going to die and have to go res at the next level. You know, but right. if you know it's a timed battle, make them work for it. And, and that doubled the amount of time when, when you use that strategy. There was one, um, uh, one Gulf Wars uh, when I first started fighting with Black Sword. We were, I think we started at the top of the hill, and I remember as en all of us ended up down past the tree there on the, you know, on the, on the castle side um, by the end of it. And we were all killed, but we won the, our side won the battle fairly resoundingly because the enemy, they must have outnumbered us three to four to one because they chased, they sent so many people after us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when they did that, they were out of the fight for so long, the rest of their, their, their guys got munched so that by the time they finally killed the last of us, they were outnumbered uh, uh, by a ton and they just got munched. And so even though we all died, the, the Tremerian army was probably still 
40 per 40 percent intact uh, at the end of the battle it was it was fairly lopsided so it's again that lure that lure tactic you know keeping them occupied keeping them out of the fight it, it gives the other part of the uh, force the, the advantage or gives the other part of the force uh, an effective uh, strategy. Um, so yeah. we're, we're just about a time, out of time. Uh, any final thoughts that you want to share with us uh, uh, before we wrap up? Um, yeah, yeah well, one of the questions you had on your original list was, was more reading. Um, apparently, the, the Deadliest Blogger site isn't around. You'll see a lot of people citing the original articles, but I guess he doesn't have the web page up anymore. Um, there, uh, he had put up the, the um, uh, two of the manuals. I wrote the Strategic Contramarium, which was all this operational strategic level of war stuff. And there's also a, a field manual. It was Shosai's original manual that, uh, um, that Ari had added some additional commentary to. Both of those are excellent resources. You'll find a lot of field, uh, the tactical field manuals uh, out there. Most of them are basically the same. There's some variations in orders and whatnot. So the biggest thing there is pick one and, 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 and make sure that it's sort of institutionalized. Um, but um, uh, the biggest thing about operational level war again is it's how to think about, it's not what to do, it's how to think about it so that when you set the pieces up that when they get to fighting that you will have more options than the other guy and if you have more it's like playing risk if you have more dice than the other guy yeah you'll get some bad dice rolls but eventually you're going to win all right um uh, i actually have sorry is there anything we're open if you have a question or a comment feel free um one thing I just noticed that this is being recorded. I was wondering if somebody could send it to me since I just got in here like 10 minutes ago. Feel free to, uh, I'm Guillermo de Cervantes. I will post the recording once I uh, set it up. Uh, it will be posted on YouTube um, so everybody can have access. And if you wish to message me, um, once I have it finished, I'll also be posting it in the uh, discussion of this event. Awesome. Um, so everybody and so it'll be it'll be put out there but if anybody doesn't see it feel free to just ask me uh, i'll be happy to send you the link awesome thank you and um for the inverted wedge the one that you were saying that you had uh florentine in the middle and if people advance forward and you would essentially just flank them like that is there a counter for that at all oh let me think about that uh well first off don't get sucked into going after a tethered goat um, don't go. Actually, don't go. <laughs> actually um, uh, that's a good one where the trying a single envelopment on their double envelopment works because you're you, you basically pin one side, and then you use and then you use your your mobile side to, uh, to to carve them back in. Um, so if you're pushing all of them back in, then they're the ones who aren't in the, you know able to uh, to get into the fight. Gotcha. Tomatsu says, "Don't take the bait." Mow them nope. down with spears. Don't take the bait. Yeah, just pin one side and then mow them down with spears. Exactly. Awesome. If if you can see that's what they're going to do or trying to do, you can move forward and concentrate your attacks at the two sidelines. Mm. And and just like Jerry had said before, putting sixty five percent of your troops onto thirty percent of theirs, and make them advance their middle, which isn't going to be very strong anyway but you're going to have to keep a central reserve to stop them from getting behind you but you can just attack the parts they give you i've seen that done at a gulf wars i don't remember exactly when but we just advanced and attacked the part that was sitting there because they had this big pocket in the middle and we ignored the pocket and attacked the two any other comments or questions there's something cool um what Sir Shosai was talking about, about having that reserve in there. Um, I'll try to link it in the discussion on the Facebook page. There's a video of the um, of Chinese riot police practicing that exact thing um, where they have a horde of people just pick random spots of the police's line and then hit them. And you see how the Chinese take a reserve unit and then basically reinforce those spots as they go. And it's exactly what he's talking about. It's a great aerial view of it um, that shows you how they react to that. 
Well, that's uh, that's when I guess your line commanders, they have to be watching uh, the opposite sides of the field to see what they're doing and 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 make those de de command decisions in the moment, you know, the, and hopefully your your unit is trained well enough. So when they say drop shields, prepare, prepare for charge. You know, I've had I've had those moments in war where they've charged at us out of the gate and we were ready and they were on the floor. You know, they just bounced off of us. And that was that was a glorious moment for me. <laughs> Pre prepare to receive a charge is probably the third most important thing to train the FBA troops to do. Don't 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 get busted up. Don't get hurt. Just just drop straight down. Let them trip over you. Mm hmm. Yeah. Or bounce off of you. Or bounce off of you. Depends on how big you are. <laughs> That's a Roman tactic, right? The shield drop. Well, you don't necessarily have to drop all the way to the ground, although it depends on what kind of shields you have. I, I used to, uh, our shield wall used to fight with 36 inch rounds. So you would go low. And yeah, if they were bigger than you, they would knock you down. But you'd knock straight down, not backwards, not forwards. But you'd knock down in a line. And when that happened, the axes would just come down and punish them. For their life choices <laughs> golf force 16 we did that with the uh the v shields they dropped down and then put them at a 45 degree angle and there's just nothing you could do right with that one um something else gee that i thought of that i wanted to share um my before i switched to subadai my former knight sirtaka um used to talk to me um a lot about this when we study real life battles like gogamela is an amazing example um, but one of the things that never factors into the SCA is the fear factor that real battles have, because at the end of the day, we're all friends. No one's actually going to die at the end of it. But what does factor into the SCA big time is ego. Yes. And that, and that can take the place of fear, because if you have like, let's say a big group of archers, one thing nobody wants to do is get killed by an archer. You walked all the way out there. You took an arrow to the face. And now you don't get to fight. So if you start throwing a ton of bolts into a flank where there's a bunch of hot stick spearmen, they're going to they're going to slow down like crazy because nobody wants to get hit. So it's mimicking that fear factor that you get in a real fight as far as how it's, it's slowing the advancement. But that's assuming you have a ton of archers. That's been kind of difficult lately. But but embarrassment is a good proxy for fear in SCA fighting. And but it's it's what uh, Sir York was talking about. It's one of those things that a general can an option of control on the field you know how do you use the archers are you going to let the archers just do their thing or are you going to use the archers in a specific manner like you're suggesting yeah i can remember golf War 17 we got our crap wrecked by the Anstiorans in one of the fights because they put all their archers in one spot they clumped them and just started laying waste to the one side with it um, and it worked really well for them. i mean we reacted it only worked once but that one time it worked it worked big time <laughs> And sometimes that's all you need if we're talking about a war point. Right. All right, folks, any other last uh, final thoughts or questions before we uh, go? Okay, um, we got uh, Albrecht, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, res battles, get those stragglers. I was told by Takamatsu if I rezzed and I saw someone walk back and he looks lost, Get, get them watered and get the next three as well. Uh, form a team of five and go where the commanders want you. Essentially in the ravine. Essential, essentially in the ravine. Yes. Yeah, that's that, that's that logistics. And that's the find a friend regroup at the end, end game. That, that's particularly important for the last 15 minutes of the, of the 10 to 15 minutes of the, uh, of the ravine. You know, save your energy, get water, get up there. If you need to rest, rest 10 feet behind the line so that if it starts to come back, you can get right on the line. I'd like to underline something that Hiramatsu said and Jerry. Um, practice. At our small practice, we can practice um, two, two on one, three on one, or three, you know, two on two, whatever. But in Black Sword, we always had at least two household war practices per year. And the first half of it, we were in just with shields and swords, not in armor, 
and we'd walk through our drills. We'd walk through our drills. And we'd walk through our drills. Then when we armored up and fought, um, then we were practicing it for real. In fact, a lot of times we'd, we'd invite another household for the afternoon. In the morning, we'd do our walkthroughs. And then when the other side showed up, we'd, we'd do the melees, us against them. And that's when you understand your commands is when you can do them in combat. Um, so, and that you have to practice to get there. Practice, practice, practice. Now is the time for it. And uh, I would recommend that if you if you can connect with your neighboring regions um, down here in the south, we have about three or four shires uh, that are all clumped together, and we get we have uh, shire combined shire practice. And so we can get our numbers up and we can get that melee experience. And, uh, and that's been beneficial. So if you have a neighboring shire or a neighboring barony uh, and you wanna do a larger practice, I encourage you to invite them, ask them to come and join you in your practice and, and put the word out that you wanna do melee practice and melee training. Knights are plentiful. The chivalry are always available to come don't be intimidated, ask them to come and give you guidance uh, in how to manage melee. Uh, it's a lot of fun and, uh, and it's even more fun when we know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Winning is always fun. Well, folks, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been, a, it's been a, an enlightening experience. I know we went over by 20 minutes, but I, I felt like it had to happen. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Sir Yorick and uh, Sir Soshai and everybody who's joined us this evening. Uh, we will be doing another one next month. Um, I'll announce who the speaker is when I do the event post for that training as well. Thank you again, everybody that's joined us. It's been a, a fun evening. Thank uh -oh. you guys. Uh -oh. Quick question, what is, it, what is GLOBE? So Globe is between um, uh, like Phoenix and Thatcher area. So I, um, I'm just getting into this and I wanted to get started, but I haven't been able to find anyone as far away there that would be interested in training. So where is Globe? <laughs> Phoenix, Phoenix. So it's between um, Thatcher and Phoenix. So we're about 80 miles from Phoenix, about 70 miles from Payson, probably about 60 or so from Thatcher. So both, uh, well, um, both Phoenix and uh, I can't remember the name of the group there, but uh, uh, Tyrius Kither is the one in Tucson. They both have very large groups, or at least used to. I had a bunch of friends from down there. I mean, yeah, I went to a practice in Tucson. I think there was 85 people there. Last month, the, uh, the furthest traveled uh, to participate what came from somebody who was in Australia. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> so we, wel we welcome the known world to this training. The better we all are, the more exciting the fights will be. It looks Absolutely. like um, Cylon Striker says he's pretty close to you, or at least decently. So that's cool, Mariah. Have a great evening, everybody. I'm going to stop recording now.